UKIP has set out its stall for the election today. Leader Nigel Farage launched the party's campaign. But do we really know what it stands for? <laughs> At an event on Canvey Island, the party's basic pitch was clear. We are the only political party that is standing up for the small man. But what does that really mean? The UKIP leader came to the Newsnight studio to explain. Also tonight, does size matter? The size of the state, that is. The UK's changed a lot in the last 30 years. How absurd it will seem in a few years' time that the state ran Pickford's removals and Glen Eagle's hotel. The big election issue is what the state spends and whether it should do less. We'll have views from across the spectrum. And another day in the political turmoil surrounding the HSBC tax scandal. Ed Miliband took on former Tory Treasurer Lord Fink. So who won? <laughs> Hello, good evening. Well, UKIP launched its election campaign today. The central claim is that far from being a one-issue protest party, UKIP is actually the party that believes in Britain and is the one that backs small business owners, families, servicemen and women, and legal migrants who come here to better their lives. What's the party against? Corporatism, the nanny state, wasted overseas aid, high speed two, and hospital car parking charges. In a moment, we'll hear from UKIP's leader, Nigel Farage, but first, Katie Razzle reports on UKIP's day. It's the ultimate political accolade. The UKIP leader now firmly in the political establishment as a puppet in the new show from some of the people behind Spitting Image. <laughs> the real Nigel Farage also has a new look. <laughs> Hello there, how are you? After a month off the booze, he says he's squeezing into suits he hasn't worn in ages. <laughs> yes, as clean as you'll see. Right, does anyone else want a coffee or two? This tour of a boatyard in Canvey Island, Essex, as part of an orchestrated series of appearances today, is almost the first we've seen of the UKIP leader this year. The other parties went too early, he said, making the campaign already incredibly boring and a turn-off for voters. But could his low profile nationally so far in 2015 be more about the need to cement his popularity in South Thanet, the seat he needs to win at the general election? If he's going to uh, make some sort of breakthrough, he's going to want to be everywhere during the, uh, during the election campaign. But if he's to win Thanet, which is by no means guaranteed, he will need to be doing a lot of local campaigning there. And so it's an inherent contradiction that the party has. Uh, certainly the polling suggests he's, uh, he's doing well, but there's nothing to suggest that it's definitely nailed on. And the crucial question will be, how many of those people who say they're voting UKIP now will still be voting UKIP come the election day? A man who refreshes parts of Britain, other leaders simply cannot reach, Mr Nigel Farage. It's not a UKIP event without some kind of reference to beer. Hence this introduction to the leader's first public speech of the year. UKIP as a political party, our candidates and our activists are reaching voters that the other parties can't reach. Rhetoric was king here, though he spelt out again that UKIP won't go into coalition after the election or do deals with any party that doesn't agree to hold a referendum on Europe. If you believe in Britain, if like us you're unashamedly patriotic... But this was more about like patriotism and standing up for what he called the small men and women than policies. We didn't learn any new ones, but he reiterated UKIP's policies we already know about. The party wants an Australian-style points system for immigration, UKIP would take people on minimum wage out of tax and scrap tuition fees for science, tech, engineering and medical degrees. They want to change the electoral voting system and abolish car park charges in NHS hospitals. NHS policy has exposed fault lines within UKIP. His party revolted at Mr Farage's suggestion the health service might have to be replaced by a system of private insurance. Perhaps not the right strategy if they want to win over left-wing voters. Particularly if UKIP are now trying to increase their support from, from Labour voters, winning over Labour voters. Um, winning on the NHS is going to be very difficult. They have to prove that they care about a real loved institution, particularly to those on the left that they're trying to win now. Do you think you should have handled things differently? Aiming for mass appeal comes at a price, with party discipline often putting UKIP in the news. Godfrey Bloom of Sluts and Bongo Bongo Land fame left the party saying it was too politically correct. 
The prospective candidate for South Basildon resigned after being recorded using racist and homophobic language. But then it's only two decades since Nigel Farage made his first election appearance, narrowly beating screaming Lord Such to a few hundred votes in the Eastleigh by-election. His party's changed a bit since then, but has it changed enough? Katie Razzle. Well, Nigel Farage put a, a lot of emphasis today on the ability of the party to take votes from all regions and from voters of all political backgrounds. Labour say that's ridiculous, as UKIP is more Tory than the Tories. So what kind of party is it? Mr Farage came into the studio earlier to answer that, uh, that question, and I started by asking him if it was, as some have said, if UKIP was the true inheritor of Thatcherism. There is one big similarity between UKIP today and Margaret Thatcher in 1979. There are times in a country and in politics where radical change is needed. She brought radical change. It came at a price, but she brought radical change. And we in UKIP think Britain needs that kind of change now. Right. So you don't think of yourself as a Thatcherite? Well, I, I could be a Churchillite, I could be a Gladstoneite. Yeah, but I, are I, you a Thatcherite? I, could, you know, I mean, all of this is irrelevant. No, was, it's not. It's a really well, was I a Thatcherite but... when I was 16? Yes. Uh, did I think the country needed radical change then? Yes. Did I think that uh, Britain had become backward uh, and was too much in the grip of left-wing trade unions? Yes. But is that relevant today? No. Well, I, I mean, your constitution does say that you seek to diminish the role of the state. Absolutely. And you want lower taxes on individuals and businesses. Yeah. So that is all a kind of, it's, it's a Thatcherite air, isn't it? I mean, which do you lean towards? Government doing less or more? Just on that specific question, you, you lean I towards... I lean towards government doing mm -hmm. less. Right. I believe that if you lift off the backs of the British people excessive regulation and the wrong levels of taxes in certain areas, they will do better and create more. Let, let me ask you, I mean, whether the, your personal position is... what your personal position is as regards the existence of the NHS. And you know why I'm asking you this, right? Your party position is you clearly believe in it and you yeah. want more money to go into it. Your personal position, as you put it in 2012, was you said, I think we're going to have to move to an insurance-based system. Now, what's your personal position now? People... Well, my personal position is uh, the same, actually, as almost everybody's was 15 years ago. Uh, all of us, Labour, Liberal Democrats, Tories and UKIP, thought that there may be an argument that if you involved an element of private competition in competing for services, we'd get better value for money and better services. That has not worked. Just look at the PFI contracts. You know, the big shiny idea that uh, Teddy Blair had, and we now have our hospitals burdened with £300 okay. billion. Sorry, pounds of the so, so what I'm saying is this. We've tried this. Everybody agreed it should be tried. It hasn't worked. So but why don't we? Why don't we? For, why don't we now? Well, sorry, say, I, I just have to. I, I actually will come to private yeah. provision in the NHS. Yeah. I, I want to ask you about that. But you talked about private insurance in the NHS. We well, have what not I tried about, that. Well, what I talked We've not about, tried it. We've not even. It's no, actually a taboo in British politics. Well, what I talked to say, about. You want to abolish the NHS? It's totally different. Uh, I, I did open that debate. You're quite right. Well, you didn't open it. And you I did say. You, you thought, and you, I did you say we're going to have to start thinking about whether the future... You said you have to start moving to it, not thinking well, about it. You, you seem to have thought The French it. do it to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah. The Dutch do it to a certain extent. And, 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 you know, one thing for certain is no debate... No debate should be closed. Mm -hmm. All debates yeah. in parties should be open. But what's your I opened up... I opened up a debate. I opened up a debate within UKIP, uh, and the answer was, let's run the National Health Service properly. And that is not just the manifesto position. It's a position I'm very happy to endorse. Do you Longer believe it, term, though? Do you personally believe it, or do you think we should move to... Do I believe system? the British government is good enough to run, ser to, to run public services properly is really your question. No, at I the moment, my question is, at is the do, moment you, it's not. do you, Nigel Farage, <laughs> believe in the existence of the NHS? Yeah, oh, yes, 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 yes. yes OK, yes. so that, we've got that, I mean, That's absolutely So that was a mistake. Down. It's that, only two years ago that you said it. This is what's so strange. This isn't oh, like we had is, to dig back to your no, years as a stockbroker. There, no, there is no mistake in calling for a debate right. and examining whether there might be a different and better way of doing Actually, things. Actually, you, no you didn't call for a debate, you called for a move. You did call for a move to it. You're not going to have that argument with your party now, though. Presumably that's over, done. If you get into well, a position well, of well, well, far more than that. Yeah. Far more than that. Next week, we will have our first big policy speech yeah. of the campaign. But it, is a, it is quite a big thing to have a 
personal U-turn on, isn't it? The, There's no per you, no, no, I'm, well, I'm, you didn't open I'm, a debate. I'm sorry, you said I'm you sorry, thought I'm it sorry. would have to you happen. See, now, 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 maybe this is why politics has become so stilted and so dull in the United Kingdom. Because anybody in any party that dares to say, shall we think differently about shall this... Shall we abolish the National Health Service? No, I didn't. You, say no, you, no, I wasn't. you didn't put it that way, but you did say you thought we would have to move to an insurance the French, system. The French have, mm. as we have, a health service uh, that is pretty much free... Not, not as much as ours, but pretty much free at the point of provision, but a different means of funding it, all right? In 10, 20 or 30 years' time, if the population of this country is going to be 80, 90 or 100 million, we may well have to rethink the whole thing. But right now, what we have is a National Health Service in which, between 2000 and 2012, we doubled expenditure and we finished up with fewer beds. Right. So the priority for now is to run it better. Mm. But you could conceive at some point in the future moving to a more French style health system. I could Britain. conceive yep, in the future could... okay. of anything happening on any policy area. <laughs> right. And anybody in politics that tells you that what is here today must be in stone forever uh, frankly isn't thinking. Right. Because the other debate, and we, you, you started on this one, was the debate about private provision in the NHS, outsourcing. It's yeah, a, yeah. Some call it privatisation, but others yeah. call it outsourcing. At the moment, about 6% of mm. NHS activity is contracted out to private providers. Uh, Andy Burnham was on this programme uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, and, and, you know, struggled to give a really clear answer about what the limits of that would be in his view. What's your view? You'd like more private provision? No, my view is this. My view is I completely understand why the Blair government began to use outsourcing and private providers, uh, and none of us at the time fought it. I now look at the consequences of it. I look at a PFI deal that, whilst it gave us shiny new hospitals, has given you know, repayments of £300 billion to the National Health Service. And, frankly, I look at outsourcing of uh, things like cleaning contracts that simply haven't worked. So what I want to see is a National Health Service that runs better. And I want to see a National Health Service with better productivity, because nobody can doubt that actually we have not got bang for our buck in the massive increase of the money that we've put in. Now, that is really, really interesting, because you are actually not there talking about a small estate. You're actually talking about a big estate. You don't, you don't want private cleaners in National Health Hospitals. You want uh, what government I'm, cleaners what in What I'm national... talking this about... This is just completely the opposite no, 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 of what no. your constitution no, 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 no. isn't it? We have a government in this country, and we have a public sector in this country, and we have a private sector in this country. Sadly, one of the things that has happened is the two have become merged, uh, in that there's been a lot of private sector involvement in the state, and a lot of the private sector relying on state contracts. I'm not sure... <laughs> that actually this has worked very well. Why can't we have a National Health Service that we run with public money and run a damn sight better than we're doing today? Right. So, just to be clear, who is going to clean a hospital ward? Someone working for a company, I don't know, like Serco, or somebody working for the National Health Service? Someone that does it properly. And at the moment, the outsourcing to a variety of companies has given us poorer results. So why don't we run it properly? Mm, it's smaller state, but, but at the same time, you want to nationalise a lot of the jobs that have currently been outsourced in the public sector and bring them back into well, the public sector. Well, as you Which yourself, an interesting, as, it, it, as you yourself say, that is only that is only a total of six percent of the national health. Yeah, but you want it lower than that, lower than six percent. Well, I want to see it done properly and run properly, and it hasn't been. Sorry, I. I, I you're, you're recording from the question. You, you want it lower than that? I thought I thought you'd. I said. want us to have. I want us to have a public sector that is efficient well, everybody wants and that. gives us bang for buck. Everybody and wants it that. it is not doing that. Right. i tell you why I think you're not giving <laughs> a clear answer. It's that what your party is trying to do is to appeal to a lot of former Labour voters ah, okay. and you've got a lot of, let's call it, Thatcherite baggage. You've got a, a constitution that talks of small government and libertarian views and you've got a past of supporting Margaret Thatcher, but now you're appealing to a different set of voters. You can you're do, lacking the clarity. You can do that whatever you, you want. You can do you. whatever you want to talk about Margaret Thatcher, or, as I say, William Gladstone. Or we can go back further if we want to have... You know, I mean, make this a <laughs> half-hour historical chat about political philosophy. Let, let me say this to you very, very clearly. Right. We want a smaller state in this country. Right. That doesn't mean we don't respect the state. It doesn't mean that there aren't things the state can't do rather better than it's doing at the moment, but do we want to lift the burden of government regulation off the backs of the British people? Yes, okay. we do. Let's go on to a different policy area. 
Do you think people earning, I don't know, over 100,000 a year, should they be paying more tax or less tax? Are they part of this corporatist Britain you're trying to... Well, they are well, paying more tax. I mean, they, you know, yeah. I mean, they've always more paid than, more tax. More, no, more tax than they are now, or, or, or less tax I wouldn't than put taxes up, no. I really wouldn't. I mean, Not even how, on them? No, I wouldn't do that. And I, think, and I think history shows you that if you do that, it actually doesn't work. You know, I'm just about old enough to remember when the top rate of income tax, let alone unearned income, but the top rate of income tax was 83%. And we had that through the last half of the 1970s. And what did it mean? What it meant was many of our brightest and best young people, whether they were doctors or engineers or whatever they were, left this country and went to other parts of the world. On the subject of tax, and we'll mm. get to Switzerland in a minute. I'm glad yeah, you brought it up. Yeah. Non-DOMs. Do you believe in non-DOMs? Well, I think... tax status for no, some very no, wealthy international No, people. I don't, actually. No, no I don't, get actually. Rid of it. Get rid of um, it. I think it... Do you know something? The, this city of London is the most extraordinary international city. People, very wealthy people, from all over the world are coming here. Rather than discounting it, we could almost charge a premium, and they would still come to London. And I also think it's wrong uh, that, you know, your billionaire from uh, Saudi Arabia or, or, or perhaps from Russia uh, can go down Bond Street uh, and buy up the most expensive and, and some of the finest jewellery in the world. I have no problem with that. Then they get to Heathrow... And get, get the VAT back. Right, right. So, I, you know, I, mean, I really, you know, I think on things like that, actually, we we really should be an awful lot tougher. Right, so we, we underprice ourselves by saying, I "Come think, here for cheap no, tax," no, rather I, than no. I think we do. Mm. Yeah. So non-DOMs. I mean, if you were Chancellor, yeah. but unlikely, I think, in the short term, but you would say, "Let's get rid of all this stupid yeah, tax I, stuff for non-DOMs." Yeah, I, mean, and I want tax. Tra I want yeah. taxes to be fair, and straightforward, and simple. Uh, but I actually, think, I, I think we've sold Britain short with mm. this. I wonder what you had made of this whole. Swiss secret Swiss bank account stuff this week. Whose side are you on? The, the, uh, some have said, well, that's, it's the wealth creators, they can do what they want with their money and they can avoid Well, I'm tax. not on the side of the big banks. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I think... Okay. It, uh, what and, about and, those and who I, put money in big banks in Switzerland? Is that... Uh, is that, is that can you see well, any that, purpose for a Swiss bank account at all? I mean, a secret Swiss bank account? Why, why no, would anyone... No, and even... I think actually that's all changed, really. The world's changed. Yeah. You know, again, I'm old enough to remember... Uh, when income taxes seemed to be punitive and wrong, people did all sorts of things to try and evade and avoid paying tax. When you have fairer tax rates, uh, then, you know, morally, it begins to become questionable. So Swiss bank accounts dodgy, to use a word well, someone else well, has well, used? They, or, or... But, but again, the trouble, with this, the trouble with this is it's also complicated. There isn't one simple answer. They may well be used for dodgy purposes, but you may find that the person that's got a Swiss bank account has a Swiss husband and a house in Switzerland. Yeah, no, and well, there obviously, might be, obviously and there might then be, it's not going to be And there dodgy. might be a very legitimate reason. Mm -hmm. I think to try, and, uh, to try and paint all of this uh, simply in terms of right and wrong isn't that straightforward. I want people paying fair taxes in this country and paying them here. I find it hugely hypocritical that we have front benches in the House of Commons that talk about this, uh, whilst they themselves, in many cases, are direct beneficiaries of trust funds that have been based all over the world. Didn't you have one in Isle of Man? Open. You had one in the Isle of well, Man for I, your family. Well, I, I, I set one up for my children, <laughs> never used it and closed it. Um, but I've never been a beneficiary of one, and I've, ne and I've never been a named beneficiary of one. In a previous interview, I did some sort of social litmus test questions on the Prime Minister. I want to try one or two of them on you. <laughs> They're kind of just to get your instinct, OK? So one of them was, I don't know if you saw it, <coughs> two gay men married in the... married, kissing in the park. Does that give you a... Does that make you think that's bad, shouldn't be allowed to happen, or do you think that's rather sweet? There, I couldn't care less. Days. You couldn't care less, so that's OK. I couldn't care less. But there are people in this country that could care less. Mm. Um, and, oh, you, well, hang on, are you... Well, well I think what's interesting should, about Should this. they be kissing or not, or should they be well, saying... They shouldn't, I... Well, they shouldn't be banned from doing it, that is for certain, and if I believe in a smaller state, then this is absolutely consistent with that. However... But you're I bit, I'm sensing you're a little bit uncomfortable with it. I'm not uncomfortable with it. What I'm saying to you is this, uh, that if there are people out there who are uncomfortable with, for example, gay marriage, they should be allowed to have that opinion without being utterly condemned. And I do think that if we believe in tolerance, we, th 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 that has to be a two-way street. Yeah. And we've rather lost sight of that. OK, so tolerate people who are against it, but the people who are against it should tolerate, tolerate it. Yeah. Tolerate people who are against it within reason. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. You know, I mean, se you know, you know sensibly, sensibly, uh, and I'm certainly referring to, you know, the active Christian communities... Uh, and for that matter, uh, Muslim communities and, and, and all other faiths.
One other one, page three. We had your colleague Douglas Carswell here. He was, he was pretty glad it looked like it was the end of page three. He didn't like page three. What, what, well, in your political parties, we all have different opinions, and I haven't got a problem with page three. You haven't a problem. It's a free press, for goodness sake. If you buy the Sun newspaper and it's got page three, you know what you're getting. Nigel Farage, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Well, which do you lean towards, government doing more or government doing less? Nigel Farage, uh, you heard him there, say he's in favour of less. But I ask you the question now, A, because we're about to discuss it at some length, but B, because this size of the state issue is perhaps the most important question facing the country in the forthcoming election. Now, on the specific question, which do you lean towards, government doing more or government doing less, YouGov asked the public in a poll last month. The public came down 62% for more government and 38% for less. But the Conservatives are aiming to get the share of national income spent by the government's departments down, famously, to levels that haven't been seen since the 1930s. That has been the subject of some argument. So first, let's get some facts from Duncan Weldon. One of Labour's most evocative lines of attack on the Conservatives is that their fiscal plans would cut spending on public services all the way back to 1930s levels. It sounds like a good line. And as the election approaches, Labour are unlikely to let bygone eras be bygone eras. But is it true? Does the experience of a decade so long ago really tell us anything about British politics today? Are we really heading back to the 1930s? <laughs> The historical memory of the 30s is depression and unemployment. But by the end of the decade, the economy was growing well. Nowadays, evidence of the 1930s is a little harder to come by. Let's be clear about where this claim comes from. According to the Office of Budget Responsibility, the government's fiscal plans imply a deep squeeze on public spending. As a share of the economy, it'll only be heading back to where it was roughly a decade ago. But spending on government departments, that's everything from schools to policing to transport, could be heading back to 1930s levels. That's because we'll be spending more on things like welfare, debt interest payments and capital investment. Looking at just government spending on departments, everything from health to defence, then the OBR numbers say it is heading to its lowest level as a share of national income since 1938. While factually correct, it's perhaps not the most informative way of looking at things. The squeeze that's currently planned is quite tight. For example, on the government's current plans, if they were to follow through with them and continue to protect areas like the NHS, schools and overseas aid, would imply that other areas of public service spending could be cut by as much as 40% compared to their 2010 level by the end of the next parliament. That would be a very tight squeeze. But it's important to remember that the economy is much bigger than it was in the 30s. This graph shows spending on government departments in real terms. If we give current spending the value of 100 and trace it back over the last few decades, we can see that it's grown considerably since the end of the Second World War. But in the next Parliament, it's forecast to fall sharply. Still, it can be hard to understand how, even as a share of national income, spending on government departments could hit 1930s levels. Because, as Labour are keen to point out, back when these tube carriages came into operation, there wasn't even an NHS. The big reason is defence. Defence spending in the late 30s was more than twice as high as a share of GDP as it will be by 2019. Maintaining a global empire and the world's second biggest navy wasn't exactly cheap. Strip out defence spending and the 1930s comparison no longer holds. The thing about the 1930s is that they were followed by the 1940s and the Second World War. By the late 30s, public spending was being boosted by rearmament, not a development that really pleased the then Chancellor. The budget deals with larger totals of expenditure 
than this country has ever had to face in times of peace. This is chiefly due to our defense program, which has been forced upon us by other countries who have failed to follow our lead in disarmament. Putting it all together, we can say that the government's plans do imply very tight spending on public services. But the 1930s comparison is somewhat misleading. We aren't, or at least we hope we aren't, about to fight a global war. And that means less need for defence spending. Still, there is a reason why the OBR brought this up in the first place. The government's current plans suggest that total spending as a share of national income will fall back to about 35% of national income by 2019. That's slightly lower than we've seen in any other year since the end of the Second World War. But perhaps more importantly, the composition of that spending is going to be quite different by 2019 than we saw, for example, in the late 1990s when we had a similar level of overall spending. Exclude defence, and spending on government departments in the late 2010s will be higher than in the late 1930s. But just because the state isn't retreating to its pre-NHS days doesn't mean there aren't deep cuts to come. You don't need to invoke the 1930s to say there'll be much more pain in the next parliament. Duncan Weldon there. Well, let's put this in an international context, because if you look at the developed countries and the proportion of national income spent by the state, you do find quite a bit of variety. Uh, we'll have a look at some of them. There are those like Finland and France. They're at the uh, top of the league. They're in the upper 50 per cent of national income spent by government. Britain actually finds itself somewhere in the middle of the range alongside countries like Germany there. We're at 44 on this international measure, which is a slightly higher figure than we would use in our domestic measures. And then you've got countries like the US and Switzerland over in the, uh, the mid-30s there. Now that measure is one measure of the size of the state, the proportion of income that's spent by the state. But when you look at the recent history of Britain, you see that there have been waves of trying to scale back the public sector in all its different forms, as Chris Cook explains. Historically, there have been three broad ways to shrink the state. The first and easiest way is to sell potentially profitable businesses that it owns. That's classic privatisation. If you see Sid, tell him. We did a lot of that in the 1980s. Airlines, telecoms, utilities, they all got sold off to the private sector. And there's not really been much clamour to get them back. Three and a half years ago, defenders of the status quo tried to brand denationalisation as irrelevant. How absurd it will seem in a few years' time that the state ran Pickford's removals and Glen Eagle's hotel. Second, the government can also cut itself back through outsourcing. So, most famously, rather than having state employees staff the trains, we now ask private companies to run them. And the coalition's health reforms will enable more outsourcing within the NHS. The ambition in these cases is to offer the same or better services, but for less money. But it's extremely controversial. NHS privatisation is now proceeding at a pace and scale never seen before as commissioners are forced to put services out to the market. For the first time, NHS spending on private and other providers has just broken through the 10 billion barrier. Third, we can offer fewer services or offer them less freely. Now that's really hard. It was controversial when we started charging university fees in 1998. Then, when we raised them. Then, when we raised them again. Most of the time, what we do is just cut budgets. So, local authorities, for example, have been squeezed, so they've been forced to drop some of their services. And, historically, problems getting treatment to NHS dentists encourage better off people to go private. Of course, politicians could also just stop offering some services, but in truth, there are very few things that they'll be comfortable defending, stopping. 
So the public sector scaled back in the 80s by selling public corporations. Uh, we know outsourcing is going on, but if you insist on really saving money and keeping taxing, taxes or borrowing down, do you have to start thinking about that third wave, substantially retreating from state-funded services? Well, joining me now is the Conservative MEP, Daniel Hannan, the Conservative MP, David Willits, Mariana Matsukata, who's Professor of Economics at the University of Sussex, and the writer, Will Hutton, whose new book is called How Good Can We Be? Good evening to you all. Uh, Daniel Hannan, let me start with you. If, if the next Conservative government, if there is to be one, wants to get public spending and borrowing down, should they carry on just pairing a little bit here and there, or are there some big decisions they should make, some functions they should just say, look, we have to get out of something altogether? Well, you know, you just showed the 1980s there, and contrary to almost universal belief, public spending in absolute terms grew every year that Margaret Thatcher was Prime Minister. But the state, as a percentage of the economy, shrank because the private sector outgrew the public sector. And that's, that should be the normal state of affairs. We have uh, unlimited human enterprise, Left to themselves, entrepreneurs will always be smarter than state bureaucrats. And so the state will kind of be left like one of those uh, jungle ruins, you know, some ruined temple in India where the, the great spray of green has just smashed through the flagstones and choked it because there will always be more essence, more vitality, more growth. And so you don't really need to cut to bring down the proportion. But I think you're just dodging a debate, aren't you? Don't we have to have a debate about all the functions? All the things they say, don't you want a debate about well, all the things the state does? Do you believe it should do health? And there, are, pensions, there are lots and lots child of things. Care, oh, I mean, all those things. Let, let's go for well, the lowest what you hanging ones. Okay, let's go yeah. for the lowest hanging yeah. ones. Uh, massive subsidies from people on low and medium incomes through their energy bills to wealthy landowners who happen to have uh, space to have uh, alternative energy rackets. Likewise, massive subsidies to people who happen to be profiteering from the common agricultural policy through higher food bills for everyone else. 17 billion a year to belong to the world's only shrinking trade bloc, the, the European Union. Plus, I would say, if, if you, I mean, you know, I'm not speaking for any future government, you just asked me. A, yeah, no, I want your personal. I mean, the, uh, the extent of in work benefits and uh, tax credits that Gordon Brown created, which didn't really exist up until then, we were getting by perfectly well without them. I think there's, th those are some of the areas which I would say are inessential spending. Mm. But you would keep all the core areas, health, education, defence, obviously. Oh, as I say, it's amazing how far you can cut. I mean, you, you had that whole uh, clip of Duncan Weldon talking about the 1930s. When the crash came, there was a Labour Chancellor, Philip Snowden, and he commissioned a, the May report to look into where to cut, and he said, we're going to go back to the spending of three years ago, because if we could, if we could get by three years ago, then Plainly, it's not essential spending. And do you know what? That was, that was enough to bring the, the, the country back into surplus. Mariana, is he right? Well, I mean, first of all, I think that there's almost no statistical evidence that there's any relationship between the size of the state and growth. The question is, you know, how you actually, uh, um, you know, work all these different departments, the kind of people you can attract to work in them. And there's a self-fulfilling prophecy, I think, that the more we bash the state, you know, using sentences like the one you just used, which, you know, no government bureaucrat will ever be as smart as a private, you know, businessman entrepreneur, the less able we will be able to get, you know, really smart, uh, you know, graduate students to come and work in government, for example. And I mean, this is one of the really interesting areas, I think, that if you actually look at the U.S. government, which is often, you know, described to us as small, it's actually quite big, and it's mission-oriented, and it's been actually able to attract sort of leaders like, you know, a Nobel Prize-winning physicist running the Department of Energy, um, because there is sort of a mission mm. to use, you know, spending the strongest to... Growth, the strongest growth I can remember in all the time I was in Belgium uh, as a member of the European Parliament was when there was no government. Uh, GDP <laughs> took off because there were no <laughs> laws. But actually, what I really... <laughs> what I think is really interesting. <laughs> we're, we're missing what I think is quite important, which is, which is a basic philosophical or moral argument, which is the difference between you or me choosing to give money to a good cause and the taxman confiscating it from us through coercive taxation and spending it on our behalf. It seems to me that it must be preferable to give people the opportunity to behave with virtue than to try and compel it. Will, will, will happen. Well, I, just to that language of the co coercive taxation, I mean, I would argue that taxation is the fee you, a citizen pays for the public mm -hmm. goods that you require. What's wrong with coercive? What happens what, if you don't pay but, it? You, but, you go to prison. Yeah. I think that I think it's something you, you de all public goods are universally available. 
and you don't want anyone free riding on on everyone else's efforts. So, so of course, you, of course, you, yeah, but it, but you use a, it's a pejorative adjective. So you you would raise the temperature by doing that, and you well, and you. Yeah, yeah, that's much more no, accurate no, 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 than no. saying we're asking no, people but, to contribute but, a little no, bit but more. You could, but, but there's, 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 there's lots of you know you don't have to be pejorative about it. You know, I'm saying, and I you know that actually you know there's interdependencies between public and private. That actually human beings associate. They have obligations to each other. They want to express them, and actually one of the ways you express them is through public activity. That's why there's public infrastructure, a bridge. Uh, but look, we're going back to absolute basic principles. Will, can I just ask you, I, I just want to no, bring it, a, root it in this okay. next in government's here challenge. Okay. Here and now. I mean, I mean, do you think we can get down to, say, 35% of national income on the British measure of these things, 35% without redefining the boundaries of what the state does? You have to redefine the boundaries. If you want to get can't to that... Can't slice. You ha already, and you're just taking a look at the criminal justice system, you know, already it's taken, you know, whether it's the Crown Prosecution Service, police, probation, legal aid, have taken swinging hits. They will take further swinging hits, as was said by the IFS, because they're unprotected. That means that, you know, the notion of how, you know, we in Britain, in this civilization, conceive justice will be transformed. Now, you may say, that's fine, because you don't want to have these dreadful coercive taxes that Dan has been talking about it. I would say that actually those are things that I certainly would vote right. for, I certainly want, and I would be prepared to pay be prepared to pay taxes for. And judging by the YouGov poll, most of my fellow citizens would too. David Willits, I want you to arbitrate a bit here. You're not uh, on the same wing of the party as Daniel Hannan. But we've got a clear divide between whether you have to redefine the state if you want to go on down or whether you can just let the rest of the economy grow and the state hold back. Where are you on that? Well, I must confess that even before I was a politician, I was an official in the Treasury. And the way that you have to do things if you're sitting in the Treasury is a combination. First of all, you are permanently pressing all departments for efficiency savings. And if you look at our record in government, uh, in autumn statements, in budgets, George Osborne would say, I want 1% off or 2% off. You've got to do things better. And that is absolutely right. Good housekeeping, a universal principle. And then secondly, you also do re you mould public spending in accordance with your priorities. And actually, I didn't completely agree with Will's example. I think there's a pretty deep social trend that there is more civility and less crime. The, cri the murder rate in London is now at its lowest for decades. It is reasonable to respond to that by saying that the kind of levels of policing that we assumed we needed can be reduced. I mean, in my own area... The response I times are, you know... Response times are lengthening. Uh, 999 calls aren't being responded to as quickly as they were. You know, the number of prison officers per, 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 per prisoner is kind of, kind of falling away dramatically. You know, prisons are overcrowded. Suicide rates are exploding. I mean, let's no, no, I mean, let's be, let's be. Yes, but you also know, and this is what all governments do, that as technology changes and social circumstances change, people's priorities change. And I mean, because Margaret Thatcher's that quote, she was right, wasn't she? We do now think that Pickford's and Glen Eagles would be absurd things well, to the public sector yeah. to I own. wanted your view on that, Mariana. I mean, Margaret Thatcher mm -hmm. said, yeah, what were we doing owning Pickfords? It does sound a bit faintly quaint now that the state might own Pickfords or Glen Eagles Hotel. Yeah, but again, I mean, you know, everything's in the detail. So look at, say, French Telecom, which is still, you know, has a big public uh, ownership, is one of the most innovative um, telephone companies in the world. Uh, the same, you know, uh, um, Italian telecom, Telecom Italia, uh, when it became privatized, cut almost all its R&D. So it all, you know, well, it depends. So I don't think there's any... It depends how you run right. a public company. No, I, no, and I think that's, again, actually an argument we heard in the clip that's correct. People used to say in the 80s, you don't need to privatize it, they can just run themselves better in a marketplace. The truth is that shifting the ownership did matter. And, but the governments will be changing... But sorry, how do you get, then, that the French one is quite efficient, the French... Telecom is quite efficient. Well, I don't know about the French. What I do know is that the productivity transformation in every nationalised industry that we privatised was massive. And there was an argument against Margaret Thatcher in 79. Don't worry. It doesn't matter who owns them. Who owns them does matter. But governments will be able to set priorities. I mean, looking back on my own experience, universities and science minister. On universities, we took a big decision that we should shift the financing of universities to graduates, not students, but to graduates, and save significant public spending. On the other half of my responsibilities on science, I'm unashamedly in favour of the government spending more on science, because I think it's something only government can do. So there, within my own responsibilities, you look at the figures, you'll see big reductions in public spending on one side, and support on the other side. And those are the kind of decisions that ministers have to make. You know, I mean, like, this whole idea that, you know, for example, I mean, even this word that was being used before, you know, the... Um, 
the public good. If you look at science, for example, if government really was just focusing on the classic public good problem, right? So basic research, high spillovers, um, private companies will not be spending on that because they can't appropriate the returns, then you wouldn't have actually gotten the kind of sort of innovation hubs of the world, including Silicon Valley, where actually government had an eye on the whole innovation chain, was funding also applied yep. research, even early stage yes. funding of companies, because the private yeah. venture capital and industry wants that. That's I agree with you about but that. there's a vision about I, that. I so I mean, right where's the vision? Whether well, it's but, health, but, but, education, Daniel or innovation. Daniel described it as weeds. I mean, Daniel described that. Or, mm. you know, there, I mean, I don't think that, you know, you've just described how, you know, in Silicon Valley, actually public endeavor has been quite crucial to the emergence of that high-tech kind of marvel. Um, it's not weeds that have actually kind of inhibited it. It's by, there's yeah. been a kind of interdependence between public and private. And yes. actually, you yes. know, yes. Whether, yes. whether it's, you know, yeah. whether it's the print, whether it was the Gutenberg printing press, you know, it, <laughs> you know there's been, there's yes. always been well, some, there's always been, today, a, there's, always, there's always been, there's always been yes. a public, Correct. there's always been a public body kind of underwriting, yes. triggering, and, catalyzing and today, private endeavor. today in Birmingham, George Osborne has announced more expenditure on exactly that type of thing. Daniel, yeah, yeah, I really, like I really want to come back to the, the basic point that Will was arguing, which is that implying that you know if you if you believe in human cooperation you believe in in more state uh, you won't find anyone who is not more state. you, believe you, won't, you state. won't find anyone state. arguing against human cooperation I mean I, I can't believe I'm having to say that you know let, let's take it as read that no one is arguing for some completely atomized society where nobody talks to anything else think of the incredible collaboration that happens all around us in the free market without us noticing. Think, think of the collaboration that goes into the, the, the can of baked beans that you buy, the, the, the melting and smelting, the, 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 the label, all the flavours, and you can buy that for 67p. What a miracle that is if we only open our eyes. You find me one this state is... measure, one minimum wage, one tax, that has done more for people on low incomes than the miracle of and 67p baked beans that you can buy on <laughs> you can't answer uh, that question. nine minutes or out of time. I'm, to yeah, 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 I'm sure we, you can do it and we can, we can do it afterwards. <laughs> Thank you all very much indeed. It's, it's going to be like that all the way to election day. It's not every day, though, that Ed Miliband comes out on top of a tussle, but has he done so today? Now, you judge. This time yesterday, Westminster was agog at a high-stakes game of chicken. The Labour leader had accused the Tory donor, Lord Fink, of tax avoidance. Lord Fink said he would sue Miliband if he repeated the charge. Well, we waited to see if he'd do so, and then the conflict petered out, with Lord Fink himself admitting that he did, in his words, engage in vanilla tax avoidance. It doesn't look like the case is going to come to court, but the episode has put a spring in the step of the Labour leader. Here's Allegra. Since the new year, Ed Miliband has been defending himself against blow after blow. A fight with Britain's business community, a tussle over his mansion tax, plans for the NHS bruised. When, last week, Ed Miliband used six questions to focus on hedge fund tax avoidance, it felt ill-advised. The party was in a pitched battle with business. Why is the Prime Minister refusing to act on this? He claims he wants to act on tax avoidance. Why won't he act? Order. Questions to the Prime Minister. One week on, Labour went again on tax avoidance, this time with more success. He's up to his neck in this. He's a dodgy Prime Minister surrounded by dodgy donors. Lord Fink, good evening. Former Tory Treasurer Lord Fink had been mentioned by name. Today, Ed Miliband alleged that I had undertaken tax avoidance activities in Switzerland. That was an allegation that was both untrue and defamatory. But this morning, as people waited expectantly for Ed Miliband's speech, Lord Fink gave an interview, and this time it was slightly different. He said... If Ed Miliband simply uses the words Lord Fink did ordinary tax avoidance, then no, I couldn't sue him. But if he made the statement dodgy about my bank account, that was potentially libelous. That was the issue I took exception to. He said his tax avoidance was vanilla, that everybody does it. Now yesterday, a Conservative donor, Lord Fink, challenged me to stand by what I said in the House of Commons, that he was engaging in tax avoidance activities. I do. And believe it or not, now today he confirms it as well. I used a general comment about dodgy donors in the Conservative Party, and I totally stand by that comment. I'm not saying it about Lord Fink. So there you have it, Ed Miliband repeating the assertion he believes Lord Fink is involved in tax avoidance, perhaps emboldened by the Tory peers interviewed this morning. But yesterday, the Labour leader created an impression he believed Lord Fink was dodgy. Would he repeat that today? No, he wouldn't. On paper, a score draw for the pair, but actually, 
Ed Miliband is up. After weeks on the ropes, Labour hope this is the return of the Ed Miliband who took on Rupert Murdoch, the Daily Mail, energy companies. Small matter that he overshadowed his own pledge today to protect the education budget in real terms. Labour wants to amplify the Tories' greatest weakness, a perception they're too close to the rich. George Osborne has called aggressive tax avoidance and evasion morally repugnant. Now for the Conservatives' one-time Treasurer, to say tax avoidance is normal is uncomfortable. Ed Miliband must box clever to stop those to his left deserting Labour for the Greens, SNP, maybe not voting at all. This very public fight with the Tories and Swiss bank donors might lure left-wing voters back. We'll soon see how many of Britain's swing voters Ed Miliband can get in his corner too. Looks to me like that boxing graphic was lifted from an old Gordon Brown one, funnily enough. Anyway, that's about it for tonight, but we leave you with a selection of the best entries from the 2015 World Press Photo Contest. At the end of this group uh, of photos, you'll see the winner announced today. It's an intimate portrait of a gay couple taken in St Petersburg, where the promotion of non-traditional sexual relationships among minors is prohibited. One of the judges said the winning photo offers a message about love being an answer in the context of all that's going on in the world. Good night.